Jim Rowan, how you going? We left off last week at this point in history with the IWGP heavyweight title being successfully defended by Keiji Muto against Togi Makabe. Um, he, Keiji Muto, has held the IWGP heavyweight championship since defeating Nakamura back in April of 2008. Um, that match, by the way, the Makabe match, ending with a chain-wrapped knee, Shining Wizard, and then the Moonsault. That um, chain Shining Wizard <laughs> sounds really cool. I wish I could find some footage of that match. But uh, the other championships, um, the Heavyweight Tag Championship is still with Makabe and his partner Yano since February of 2008. They last defended against Giant Bernard and Rick Fuller. There's the Junior Heavyweight Tag Team Championships. They're still held by Minoru and Prince Devitt since July. And the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Championship, just very recently in our history here, has changed hands. Low-key defeating Tiger Mask on the 21st of the 9th. In fact, it was that same card that I just talked about. Mudo defended against Makabe. Tiger Mask did not successfully defend against Loki on that card we just covered last week. We have three of the four major tournaments for New Japan already complete. Tanahashi won the New Japan Cup. Inoue won the Best of Super Juniors. And Goto won the G1 Climax. For the other major promotions, the Triple Crown title has been on Suwama since April of 2008. The GHC heavyweight title for Noah just recently changed hands as well. That was Morishima uh, dropping it to Kensuke Sasaki on the 6th of September. Morishima had the title since March. And uh, Masato Tanaka has held the 0-1 heavyweight championship for a fair while now. But... On to where we're up to. Uh, like I said, we ended on the 21st of September last week. On the 23rd of September 2008, in Wakayama, Loki defeated Kazuchiko Kado. Liger and Tiger Mask defeated Milano and Taichi. Goto Nakamura, Tanahashi, and Inoue defeat GBH's Giant Bernard, Rick Fuller. Tomowaki Honma and Tomohiro Ishii. You see there um, the rise pair of Goto and Nakamura being positioned more on the uh, babyface side there. They're interchangeable, I think. They can they can go against the babyfaces and be the heels, or at the moment as they are, given Giant Bernard and Rick Fuller just turned on them, they're on the babyface side. There was a couple of big cards across the other promotions, though, that I'll cover quickly. So on the 27th of September, Noah's Great Voyage in Osaka, the GHC Junior Heavyweight Tag Team title, we saw the New Japan pair of Tetsuya Naito and Yujiro, No Limit, go up against their champions in Noah, Kotaro Suzuki and Yoshinobu Kanemaru, unfortunately, from a New Japan perspective. Naito and Yujiro couldn't get the job done. The heavyweight title was also on the line on that card. Kensuke Sasaki's first defense of this reign, defeating Muhammad Yone. The next night, for All Japan Pro Wrestling on their flashing tour in Yokohama, the World Junior Heavyweight title was on the line. Ryuji Hijikata, the champion dropping the title to Naomichi Marifuji. Now, uh, Marifuji was noted going into this match uh, as per the Wrestling Observer. He's held every championship there is in Noah, but his new goal is the All Japan Junior title because he's in his 10th year as a pro wrestler and he was Giant Barber's last protege and his goal at that time was to hold the junior belt, but it was too early in his career uh, to ever win it. So this was reportedly a show-stealing match with 
Marufuji pinning Hijikata in 25 and a half minutes. There's talk of Noah building up a Marufuji versus Kenta singles match. Um, that is to come. This is still the report by Meltzer, but yeah, that match is coming. Kenta will be facing Daniel, sorry, Brian Danielson uh, in October for the... Well, this doesn't make sense. It says for the GHC Junior... Oh, right, of course. Sorry. So that'll be for the, the NOAA Junior title. Marufuji's just won the All Japan title, but of course Marufuji is a NOAA wrestler. That's why I'm a little bit confused here. So Marufuji's gone over to All Japan to win their Junior title, but Kenta... Um, da Brian Danielson, of course, he just won the GHC Junior title. So Kenta's going to be challenging Danielson... Uh, and a win there for Kenta would obviously add a new dimension to Marafuji versus Kenta. That'd be two uh, junior heavyweight champions going at it. Um, Kaz Hayashi and Shuji Kondo, who apparently had recently turned babyface, are being set up as the All Japan challenges for Marafuji, though, with the idea of, or well, with the gimmick, I, I suppose, of trying to get their company's title back. Now, also on that same All Japan card, uh, we saw Kai and Satoshi Kojima, who are a, a tag team called F4, but they were also joined by Tenzan, so there's also the Tenkoji connection there. So the three of them took on Gorentai's Mizada, Minoru Suzuki and Taiyo Kea, and they picked up the win. Kai Kojima Tenzan. And then the main event was for the Triple Crown title. We talked about this at the end of the last podcast. Great Muta is the IWGP heavyweight champion, and he faces the All Japan Triple Crown champion, Suwama, for only the Triple Crown title. It is not a double title match. It is only All Japan's top prize on the line. And a pretty big result here. With a moonsault in nearly 25 minutes, Muto, or sorry, actually, perhaps I should make the distinction. In All Japan, Keiji Muto wrestles as the Great Muto. So it's actually the Great Muto that wins the Triple Crown title. And as long as we consider him one being with Keiji Muto, he now holds the Triple Crown title and the IWGP Heavyweight Championship at the same time. He's only the second wrestler to ever do that. Satoshi Kojima was the first back in 2005, I believe, around that time, if not. And um, he's also credited in Japan with tying Giant Barber's all-time Japanese record by winning his 34th career major promotion championship. Uh, and they count major tournament wins as championships in that number. After this match occurred, Minoru Suzuki attacked Muta, choked him out, and set up a match when All Japan returns to Sumo Hall on the 3rd of November. All Japan are high on Suwama, so uh, because he's you know he's their homegrown talent. I think they just felt like they needed more star power going into that Sumo Hall event. So there you have it. Suwama's Triple Crown Championship reign comes to an end, and Muto at what? How old would he be here? Let's quickly look that up. K.G. Muto. Okay, so he was born in 62. We're about to get a glimpse into my poor mathematics. Um, so that'd be... 46? Well, he's, he'd, be, he'd be 45 turning 46 in December. 45 years old. I mean, it's not that old, especially when you look at how the title's being passed around in WWE at the moment, but um, yeah, he is not young, and he holds the two biggest prizes, arguably, in Japanese wrestling. I mean, certainly the GHC heavyweight title's up there as well, but um, 
Wow. There you go. Mood is on top, baby. On the 29th of August, uh, just to wrap up all the other promotions that we look at here, Zero One held a uh, an event in Corroquin Hall. The international junior heavyweight title was on the line, and Hidaka successfully defended against New Japan's Ryusuke Taguchi. The main event of this one also held uh, had a New Japan wrestler. It was Yuji Nagata, and he defended defeated Shinjiro Otani. And that wraps up September. So moving into October, on the 2nd, for New Japan, uh, although we've got some uh, different uh, invaders, so to speak, on the card, starting with Mazada and Nasawa of Tokyo Gorentai. They defeated El Samurai and Jushin Thunder Liger. We have Mochizuki defeating Tetsuya Naito. Tiger Mars defeating Takamura. Masato Tanaka and Riki Choshu defeating Kohei Sato and Masahiro Chono. Hiroshi Tanahashi defeating Koji Kanemoto in just over 20 minutes. And then in the main event, Nakanishi and Yoshi of All Japan defeating Daisuke Sakamoto and Shinjiro Otani. So that's a New Japan premium show. Um, which I, I believe are shows more likely to have. Um, what were those shows I used to cover? Uh, that well, there was the Apache shows, but what were the other ones? Uh, with the different canon to them, I forget the name of them now. But I think maybe these premium shows have taken the place of those since those ended. Um, just kind of getting. I don't think these guys are freelancers so much as... Well, maybe they are, but they, you know, uh, mostly wrestle with all Japan I know are involved here and whatnot. Um, anyway, there's not a lot that happens uh, until a big event, New Japan Destruction, on the 13th. So a quick detour to TNA, just because they had Bound for Glory, one of their big events... Um, and I don't know, I think at this point I'm just covering TNA because of how funny it is. A bimbo brawl match, ODB, Raka Khan, and Rhino. Okay, so you read bimbo brawl, and as awful as it is, you imagine women, Rhino's in the match, okay. Uh, they defeated the beautiful people, which is Angelina Love, Cute Kip, and Velvet Sky. Um, Rhino the bimbo. Okay. And then they had a four way tag team monsters brawl match for the TNA World Tag Team Championship. Steve McMichael was the guest referee. Old Mongo. All right. So, Beer Money, that's James Storm and Robert Roode. They are the champions and they defended successfully. The other teams against them were Abyss and Matt Morgan, um, Hernandez and Homicide, and Brother Devon and Brother Ray. Um, just in case you've never seen five different steps in a match before, because we had McMichael reportedly um, stuffing out this match, but only because, perhaps, in fairness, he was only made the referee the day of the show because um, they had a ringside enforcer in a different match, and they didn't want to repeat that stipulation so they made him the referee instead okay but just to count them I counted five so we've got a championship on the line there's one step the fact that it's a four way tag team match it's a monsters ball match well I guess the fact that it's a tag team match is its own step so that's maybe that's what I counted as five tag it's got a championship it's a four-way, it's a monstrous ball, and it's got a guest referee. Goodness gracious. If you don't think being a tag is a step, I mean, that is, I mean, yeah, I think it's, you know, that's a step. It's different from a singles match. I know they're just commonplace now, but all right. Well, it's four at least. Anyway, um, also on the card, we had Booker T defeating AJ Styles and Christian Cage. Mick Foley was the special ringside enforcer that I spoke of earlier 
That was for a match wherein Jeff Jarrett defeated Kurt Angle. And then for the TNA World Heavyweight Championship, Sting defeated Samoa Joe. Where regardless of the outcome, there would be no rematch. And Kevin Nash turned heel uh, by striking his friend Joe with a baseball bat while the referee wasn't looking, allowing Sting to take advantage and pin Joe with a scorpion death drop. That brings to an end a long reign by uh, Samoa Joe. Nash's actions were explained on the 16th of October episode of TNA Impact where he said that Joe disrespected him and his longtime real-life friend, <laughs> as opposed to this fake TV show, his longtime real friend Scott Hall in late 2007 when Joe insulted Hall for not showing up at TNA's December pay-per-view turning point. Um, yeah, look, I didn't watch that, but I can certainly imagine TNA making a lot of the same mistakes WCW did in terms of that, you know, insider stuff that just makes the rest of the show sound like a waste of time. I don't know how they don't learn their lesson about that, but um, let's get to the good stuff. Because on the 13th of October, New Japan held the uh, destruction event in Ryugoku Kokujikan. That's uh, Sumo Hall for those of us that struggle with that pronunciation. Um, myself included. Uh, all right, so cool stage, by the way. Just like a big wide screen, it takes up the whole stage. Just a little bit. Um, I don't know. They put some effort into this one. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't find a lot of these matches to watch. Um, for free without going and digging up some DVD or something. So I must extend thanks to Mike Campbell of 411 Mania. He reviewed this event back in 2009 and um, I thought it was a it was a good article. It was an interesting read. So I thought, well, hey, let's uh, let's hit, let him take us through this. There are a couple of matches that are on. New Japan World, uh, I'll point those out as we go, and I did watch and review those myself, but for the rest, take it away, Mike. I mean, he's not actually here, I'm going to have to read it, but okay, the first match, IWGB Junior Heavyweight Tag Team title match, no limit, take on uh, the champions Minoru and Prince Devitt. Now with Mike. Okay, The idea here, ostensibly, was to finally show the world that no limit has risen beyond Young Lion status in New Japan. Maybe the simple fact that they won the title accomplished this, or the fact that Yujiro won a match for his team by pinning Tanaka, who's been on top of the junior division since the early part of the decade. But to me, Mike Campbell, they don't accomplish that feat as well as they could have. The main reason is that there just isn't a lot of offense that the challengers get in. It's not that they don't have it. Things like Naito killing Devitt with a German suplex, Naito's corkscrew body block, their double flapjack, and Yujiro's intercollegiate slam that gets the win uh, proof no limit have offense at their disposal. But Virtually every near fall for the challengers is on the heels of a flash pin or some type of counter into a cradle. Worth mentioning now, I suppose. He, uh, Mike's um, describing this in hindsight, so if that paragraph didn't already make it clear. No limit. Defeat. Rise. And win the tag team, the junior heavyweight tag team titles in this match. Okay. But continuing, Mike. In addition to No Limit rolling out more offense to control action, it also would have helped if the champions, mostly Tanaka, um, by Tanaka, by the way, he refers to Minoru. I might just replace that and might make it simpler. So um, it also would have helped if the champions, mostly Minoru, had done more throughout the match to make the underdog challenges not look so much like underdogs. But Minoru doesn't seem to want to give them too much offense, or make much of it count. At one point, Naito surprises him with two cradles in a row. Instead of using facials or body language to show that he was outsmarted, Minoru counters into an armbar. 
A bit later on, the challengers hit a double team onto Minoru, and Yujiro goes up for a moonsault, but Minoru gets his knees up. Minoru winds up being countered into a cradle by Yujiro right afterwards, so there wasn't any reason why Minoru couldn't simply just let him have hit the moonsault and give him a near fall from it. Devitt also had his own similar moment when he gives Naito an airplane spin, and then both of them uh, put over the dizziness, but then he sidesteps into a charging Yujiro and quickly dispatches him. Letting Yujiro surprise him like that would have said a lot for No Limit's aggressiveness and willingness to do whatever it takes to win the titles. The big saving grace to this is No Limit's fluidity and the timing of all four. The execution is great for the most part, and all four are in the right place at the right times to make various spots and exchanges come off well. And considering that this is pretty much a 10 minute sprint, that's much more impressive that, or it's much more impressive that nothing winds up being outright blown or comes off badly due to them not being on the same page. If Minoru and Devitt were able or willing to help give the champions some rub, this could have been an excellent opener. Instead, it's still fun, but it's got room for improvement. Okay, that were Mike's thoughts on the first one. Uh, the next match, we'll go through these quicker just because they're not... Eh, well, we'll see how we go. We got, we got time to work with. Okay, GBH is Gato, Jado, and Loki in a... Okay, yeah, look, um, Mike appears to just... All of these are in... I'll, I'll just read the results and then we'll get into Mike's commentary because he kind of does it all um, past tense uh, or in, on reflection of the match. So, um, yeah, Gato, Jado, and Loki defeated Jushin Thunder Liger, Koji Kanemoto, and Tiger Mask. This one took uh, 7 minutes and 46 seconds. So, Mike Campbell says, Aside from giving Key, the junior heavyweight champion, a pinfall over Liger, there doesn't seem to be much other purpose for this. Key and Tiger, the former champion, have a quick scrum to start things off, with Tiger looking for revenge on the man that took his title. The middle portion is carried by Kanemoto being in trouble, but he's not exactly great with seeming like he's in trouble. There's a nice moment when he catches Key with a surprise kick and goes to tag and then stops to hit Gato and Jada with a double drop kick and then tags in Liger. Liger seems to fall way too easily. He only really takes two kicks from Key and the Key Crusher puts him down. That didn't help that six re re or it didn't help that six wrestlers only got seven minutes but Koji spending the bulk of it accomplishing nothing special and then Liger going down far too easily only makes it worse. The next match, again GBH, unfortunately getting the win. Togi Mikabe, Tomohiro Ishii and Toru Yano defeating the team... Oh no, not quite. I was going to say the team we talked about uh, having a match earlier. So F4 is the group that Satoshi Kojima is a part of in All Japan. He's joined by Kai, who was a part of that tag team match, but also Hiroshi Yamamoto. Yamoto. No, Yama. Yamato. Yamato. Sorry, I'm adding extra maz. Yamato. My apologies, Hiroshi. Okay. Yamato, Kai, and Kojima went down to Mikabe, Ishii, and Yano in 10 minutes. Mike Campbell says, This actually makes for a decent continuation of the Tenzan Kojima vs. Mikabe Taro tag match from the All Japan show on the 31st of August. The wrestling all, or isn't always as good as it could be, because GBH are more concerned with working the style of match, or working a style of match, as opposed to a story. But they're... Control segment on Kai is, is, is a good example of this. GBH shows plenty of evil intensity, but they don't really do much. It's a lot of punching and kicking. When GBH come up with something original, like Yano choking him with... Ch choking someone with tape, I guess they mean Kai. Um, or slamming Kai into the exposed turnbuckle. It really puts over the punishment being dealt to him. Uh, they don't do things like that very often, so Kai doesn't have a whole lot to work with. Okay. 
I mean, I don't think what Mike Campbell means there is that GBH don't expose turnbuckles often or use weapons often. I think he means that these uh, little extra spots were few and far between, and otherwise it's just brawling. So, um, yeah, he's not loving this one, but I'll let him continue here. Kojima also looks pretty solid in his role as the fired-up hot tag. The match is too short to pull off everything as well as they could have, but there is one great moment from Kojima. He ducks a Makabe swing and plants him with a reverse neckbreaker. Kojima crawls over like he's going for the cover, but opts to rain down on Makabe with fists instead of trying for the pin. There's another nice part toward the end where Kojima avoids a charging Yano in the corner and levels Makabe with a, a lariat. Then she hits Kojima with a chair to make him tag in Yamo Damn it! Yamato. And things break down to leave Yamato and Yano, which leads to Yano finishing him with the Onikoroshi. It almost seems odd that they don't need any cheating or shady tactics to do so. Um, oh, apart from all the cheating that they did do, but I guess it just means it wasn't involved in the finish. Mike here, continuing. Um, it makes sense with Yano being half of the tag champions and Yamato being so inexperienced, but GBH has shown before that they aren't above doing something like that for any reason other than just because they can. If they had another five or ten minutes to work with, maybe throwing Tenzan and Izka to make this an egg man would have been pretty neat. But of course, Tenzan and Izka had uh, a singles match on this card, which is more interesting than adding him to a tag match, in my opinion. Um, the next match was another tag match. We had Big Mountains, Minabu Nakanishi and Yutaka Yoshi, defeating Hiroshi Tanahashi and Mas Masahiro Chono. Uh, just a quick note from me that I know following this match, Tanahashi skips the next New Japan tour to perform in TNA until mid-November, so you can imagine how exciting that would be if you've been following TNA and what was the last one that Rhino was a part of? The Bimbo Brawl? <laughs> yeah, well, maybe Tanahashi will be a part of the next one. But Mike Campbell here of 411 Mania, his description of this match between Nakanishi Yoshi versus Tanahashi and Chono. I'm not a huge fan of making declaration that someone needs to retire, but if this is any indication, Chono ought to hang it up. He uses next to no offense other than Yakuza kicks and shining Yakuza kicks, which don't look very good. And watching Nakanishi and Yoshi trade strikes with him is a sad sight. They look like they're trying not to scuff their boots when they kick. Chono is responsible for the funniest moment of the match, although I don't think it was intended to be a comedy spot, when Yoshi was throwing his weight around and Chono hit and hit Chono with a big splash, only for Chono to kick out at one. Yoshi's time away from New Japan doesn't seem to have done much for him. He doesn't do anything vastly different here than he was doing in the last four or five years, aside from slapping his belly like Kamala while no-selling Tanahashi, punching him in the stomach. I guess this deserves a little bit of credit for trying to tell a story, although it's not the most logical one. The idea seems to be that Tanahashi and Chono can't get, a ro can't get along, which makes enough sense. But the show, but to show it, well, Mike, clean up your grammar. But, <laughs> but to show it by having Tanahashi jumping the gun several times and getting his tag and getting his team in trouble, something that would be expected from one of New Japan's rookies. Not a nearly 10-year veteran and two-time IWGP champion, but that's how it goes. Chono gears up for another Yakuza kick, and Tanahashi hits the ring and gives Yoshi a flying forearm. Chono looks at him in disbelief, and Yoshi attacks Chono from behind. After getting tagged in later, Tanahashi gets into trouble and gets an opening, and a chance to tag when he ducks a charging lariat and Yoshi and Nakanishi hit each other, but instead of tagging, he presses his advantage and loses it again when Nakanishi hits a Polish hammer. Yoshi keeps Chono at bay and Tanahashi is finished off with the Doomsday body press from Yoshi and Nakanishi's Hercules cutter. With Tanahashi headed stateside, it made sense for him to be the one laying down. But there had to be a way of getting from points A to B without making him look so inferior to the other three. Fair point. Obviously I didn't see the match, but... Um, 
interesting commentary there from Mike Campbell. And uh, he also noted there, kind of, of course, that, um, yeah, Tanahashi's going to do a tour over in TNA. Um, when I had TNA's service, or now I suppose Impact's video service, they... Um, I, I looked for all the New Japan content I could, and I didn't... I mean, I, I kind of pulled out everything um, that I found, and I don't think I found anything to do with Tanahashi being over there. And once again, you know, considering the kind of, frankly, rubbish it appears TNA's putting on at the moment, I'm not sure I want to see it. I think it would just... Uh, I think it would, uh, you know, just kind of ruin my image of Tanahashi at the moment. He's doing so well. Um, okay, now we had a big singles match uh, up next. Giant Bernard defeated Hiroki Goto, which to me is staggering. Um, I mean, Carl Anderson did interfere to help Bernard, but this is a not a normal way to rehab a prospect after losing a title challenge. He's just come off a G1 win and now we I mean losing to the champions one thing and Giant Bernardo's book strong don't get me wrong but he's in a different division you know Giant Bernard's pretty strictly a tag guy um, I mean maybe they're about to change it we, we can look out for that if, if Bernard's having a run then okay but um, yeah I, I couldn't make sense of this uh, on the face of it uh, I just I did know that Carl Anderson interfered, so let's see what Mike Campbell thought, having actually seen the match. As good as Goto looks for parts of this match, namely in how believable he is as a young kid fighting from underneath, some of his limitations are also fully on display. It probably helps that Goto was working with Bernard, who, between his stints in WWE and All Japan, and now a part of GBH, has the monster heel role down cold. I would agree with Mike on that. Bernard knows what to do to keep the fans behind Goto. Bernard focuses on Goto's body with a sick powerbomb that dropped Goto perpendicular on the apron. And then he continues working it over with a big splash of body scissors. And it put that much more meaning into the Baldo bomb, which wound up as a hot near fall. Unlike his match with Muto from August... Goto did a very nice job at getting over the story of his midsection being hurt. It wasn't on the level of a Kawada or Otani, but he was more than able to get his point across. However, just like the Muto match, Goto quickly forgot about being hurt when it was his turn to have a go on offense. There were several instances where Goto's ribs being hurt could have gained a kick out, could have gained a kick out, or Goto being unable to do something, but instead. They were just ignored. A good example of that is Goto's near fall off a German suplex. It makes sense that Goto would be unable to hold the bridge, but he does so just fine, and Bernard kicks out. The ribs would also explain why Goto cannot lift him for the shouting. Instead, it's just a case of Bernard being too big, and Goto not being strong enough. Goto's comeback on Bernard is also hampered because Goto doesn't seem to have much offense to work with. The only lead-in to the German suplex was a charging lariat. Granted, Bernard was distracted because he'd nearly punched Carl Anderson. So it made sense for so it made sense that it took him. Sorry, let me just start that again. I got a little bit confused because I was like, Bernard attacking Carl Anderson, but the idea was, um, I suppose maybe Goto ducked and then Bernard Bernard um, nearly punched his partner Carl Anderson. So. I'll start that sentence again, sorry. Granted, Bernard was distracted because he'd nearly punched Carl Anderson, so it made sense that it took more out of him than usual. But Goto should have done something more before going for the move, especially with it being such a close near fall for him. The only time it legitimately looks like Goto's going to pull off the win is with the Cobra Clutch, because that's something that Goto can believably do to someone much larger than he is, and it was done out of nowhere. The layout of the match and the ending with Anderson's interference allowing Bernard to get the win with the Bernard driver were clearly done to keep Goto looking strong. Bernard knew what to do to accomplish that. It's just too bad that Goto didn't seem to know. 
That makes me want to go back and look at what I thought of that title match between Goto and Muta. I hope I can find it quickly. Goto and Muta. Because he didn't... I remember... There it is. Okay. Because I remember not thinking... I didn't write too much about the match. It was only on Daily Motion, so I didn't do the whole proper review that I would do if it's on um, New Japan World. Which, by the way, is exactly the case with the next match. So this will be linked in the description. You'll need a subscription. Did I say subscription? No. This will be linked in the description. You will need a subscription for New Japan World in order to watch it. A chain death match between Takashi Iska and Hiroyoshi Tenzan. This violent feud continues. So we have Iska entering with a group of his GBH buddies, the iron glove around his neck and a snarl on his face. Tenzan has Kojima with him for backup. He looks pretty good for a guy that was hit by a bus a few days ago. See, I put that in there with no reference. He was hit by a bus? Let's look that up quickly. Hiro Yoshi Tenzan hit by bus. I can't see anything on this. I don't know what that refers to. Okay. Um, well, perhaps he was hit by a bus. Uh, I probably should have, I don't know, linked a news article or something. Anyway, he's looking good. Tenzan's looking fine. The chain is connected to each man's left wrist, as is about two-thirds um, of the... Well, it is about two-thirds the width of the ring. Uh, Tenzan has the early advantage. He puts the chain to work with some strikes. The referee is Tiger Hattori. He tries to control him as best he can, but surely this is a no-rules match anyway. Iska is busted open mere minutes into the fight with uh, all the chain strikes coming his way. He even bites at the wound, Tenzan, repeatedly, smearing blood on Tenzan's face. And Iska's a mess too. There's a lariat that sends Iska over the top rope, and now GBH pull on the chain, and Tenzan's dragged outside as well. GBH attack... But Kojima and Yamoto of Kai, uh, sorry, no, of F4. It's Kojima Yamo, Yamato. What? That, I hope he isn't featuring much because he's really doing my head in with his name. Such a simple name too. Kojima, Yamato, and Kai are all of F4. And they're all there to back Tenzan up, fighting off the GBH guys. Uh, Iska still able to obtain the advantage out of it. And they move back into the ring. Iska's choking Tenzan, who's also now bleeding from the head uh, with the chain that they share. He tears off the corner pad and rams Tenzan into it. Iska further opens up the cut on Tenzan's head with punches and headbutts, but the fans cry Tenzan's name as they attempt to will him into a comeback. Iska hits a pile driver. He goes for it again, but Tenzan reverses it, and the crowd cheer. His comeback is short-lived. Iska begins to throw him around with an exploder, or with several exploder suplexes, and Kojima worriedly looks on. Iska locks on the sleeper hold, the same move that confirmed his betrayal of his partner-turned-rival. Tenzan fights him off and pushes Iska down into the Anaconda Vice. Iska desperately tries to fight his way out, but Tenzan's grip is tight. Using the chain, Iska's finally able to break free with punches to the side of the head. Tenzan keeps coming forward with lariats and kicks. He flies at Iska with a bloody headbutt off the middle turnbuckle. A Tenzan tombstone driver connects. Tenzan surely has the match won, but he collapses with fatigue. He drags Iska to the back, sorry, drags Iska back to the middle and goes off the turnbuckle, fighting, well, goes to the turnbuckle, sorry, fighting off Gato and then Honma, but it was enough time for Iska to come over and pull Tenzan down using the chain. So they strike back and forth. Yano gets involved, but Kojima whacks him with a lariat, 
before calling to Tenzan to finish the job. Tenzan hits the TTD again, but now it's Makabe that enters, and his arm is wrapped in a chain. He hits Tenzan with it. Iska grabs the iron glove. He cracks Tenzan in the jaw. He then uses the chain they're linked by to tie up Tenzan's hands and wraps it around his neck. Iska puts his foot on Tenzan's back and pulls on the chain, choking Tenzan unconscious. Taika Hattori has no choice but to stop the match. The doctors rush into the ring and immediately tend to Tenzan. Kojima looks distraught. GBH, meanwhile, drag Iska out of the ring and carry him to the back. I called this match good because it was good for what it was. Um, I definitely want Iska and GBH to get theirs. I'm really sick of their antics, so I suppose that's the job of a heel. Uh, so therefore, they've been successful in that regard. Um, still, as shocking a fight as it was, it didn't produce the same kind of drama a great wrestling match would have. For me, anyway. Kojima definitely adds to the story. It's nice to see Tenzan with a, a bit of backup, but it'd be, it'd be great to see them triumph together. Let's see what's to come. Um, okay. The next match, unfortunately, I couldn't find any footage of. It is a 0-1 World Heavyweight title match. It's between... Uh, well, the champion, of course. Well, I'll just I'll give you the result because Mike Campbell's going to be taking this one. So Yuji Nagata defeated Masato Tanaka, bringing an end to a long title reign for Tanaka. And Nagata taking home the 0-1 world title. This is a, a bit of a feud that's been bubbling with these two for a while now, but I'll let Mike Campbell take it away. So, take away the chain, and this is how Iska and Tenzan's match should have been. Nothing cute, nothing fancy, just a good old-fashioned heated fight. Well, there you go, he already agrees with me. If one's idea of good wrestling is strictly within the realm of body part psych and pre-split all Japan level storytelling, then this won't score very high. Oh, okay. Everything is secondary to the task of beating the tar out of each other. Nagata lets loose with kicks to the chest. Tanaka has his elbows. There's a chair shot. They trade off slaps to the face several times. It also helps that the crowd is rabid in their support of Nagata. A fairly good description of this match would be that it's more about being flashy than substantive, but the flash is done so well that they're able to get by on minimum substance, and the substance in this case being a couple of well-timed spots and some killer facials and selling by Tanaka. Sorry. Phone on silent, everyone. Please put your phones on silent. Okay. Not to say this isn't perfect. I have also... Uh, or always let me start that again I'm sorry Mike Campbell I can't read not to say that this is perfect I've always been critical of Nagata for getting goofy during a match and this isn't an exception his biggest offense in that regard is his comeback he takes several forearm shots from Tanaka culminating in a charging one and Nagata charges up for a knee strike after the running one it doesn't even matter because Tanaka just sucked up the knee and then charge for a second elbow, and then charge into another Nagata knee. Nagata may as well have just sold the running one, and then hit the knee when Tanaka charged. Nagata also gets planted with a suplex, and then sits up like he's, been, like he's about to make a comeback, but then changes his mind and flops back down again. I've never been a fan of rolling out of finishes multiple times when the person doing them isn't winning, which is what happens with the sliding D. Nagata kicks out of the first one, uh, or kicking out of the first one works, because Tanaka didn't really get all of it. The third has Nagata's awesome counter. But there any, isn't any good reason for the second one. Tanaka hit it perfectly, and Nagata gets busted open from it, and then the, Nagata just kicks out. This is the move that's been putting everyone down from New Japan that stepped into the ring with Tanaka, and Nagata just kicks out like it wasn't enough. Thankfully, the goofiness is counterbalanced by the good, ma by the good things that they both do. Nagata gets a couple of fabulous counters that turn the tide of the match much more believably than his idea of blowing something off to do something else. 
The best one is the third sliding D, which Nagata counters into an armbar. There's another good one a bit earlier, when Tanaka attempts a tornado DDT and Nagata blocks it, placing Tanaka on the ropes and uh, does Mudo's dragon screw, neckbreaker, which makes me wonder if that's going to be the new shining wizard in regards to everyone stealing it. Not to be outdone, Tanaka is his own... <coughs> excuse me. Tanaka, his own great counter when Nagata's attempt at an exploder off the second rope winds up as a second sun flip as a sunset flip powerbomb. There's also some good selling, more from Tanaka than Nagata, but Yuji has his moments, such as nearly being counted out after the brain buster on the floor and his reaction to the diamond dust. But Tanaka's is beautiful, especially toward the end. The look of desperation on his face when Nagata hits his first backdrop, backdrop is breathtaking and more than a bit ironic given the way he'd been running through New Japan wrestlers all year and his attempts to reach for the ropes are that much better, but Yuji isn't to be denied, and the bridging backdrop is finally enough to knock the wall, knock down the wall that was Tanaka. This isn't perfect. There's no question that things could have been done differently, the bulk of which are Nagata's nutty tendencies, and little things like finding a different way to get Nagata out of the second sliding D, but even as it is, this is still a damn fine match. I just wonder if it's a compliment toward Tanaka or an indication of the New Japan roster that this spanked everything that preceded it on the card. Three and a half stars. That brings us to the main event. And um, once again, this is on New Japan World. Link will be in the description. The IWGP heavyweight title is on the line and perhaps important to note that only the IWGP title is on the line against Shinsuke Nakamura. They're not, uh, he's not also challenging for the All Japan uh, title, the Triple Crown Championship. He's just after the IWGP gold. Since falling short in the G1, Nakamura supported Goto until he lost to Muto when he stepped in to make his own challenge. This was not necessarily at the detriment of his relationship with Goto, though they were unsuccessful in their challenge for the tag titles against GBH's MVP. That's uh, Makabe and Yano, for those that forget. Most violent players. There is a fair argument that the pair from Rise were distracted by the loss of Loki, Bernard and Fuller to GBH during that event before the title match occurred. Needless to say, this only has strengthened the rivalry between Rise and GBH. Muto, meanwhile has been on a resurgence. After taking the IWGP heavyweight title from Nakamura in April, he held the IWG, sorry, he held the AJPW, the All Japan Tag Titles, until June, and then defended the IWGP title against Nakanishi in July, Goto in August, and Makabe in September. Still primarily working for All Japan, he qualified for a title shot at the Triple Crown against Suwama, and became the second ever concurrent New Japan and All Japan double champion. Of the heavyweight titles, that is. Tonight he only defends the IWGP title. That's a little set up here. Now we see Nakamura. He's still in his red shorty trunks. He telling of his efforts to find himself, though, I think. He, um, he's looking a bit softer as well than when he originally had returned from excursion. They start pretty slowly with a lot of train wrestling. It's not bad, but it's very measured. They are clearly both wary of one another. Muto suddenly launches into several dragon screws and latches onto a heel hook, but Nakamura reaches the ropes. Muto continues to target the leg, as he did in their first encounter, and in fairness, as he does in almost every match. Nakamura hits a power slam and then a back suplex. Nakamura latches onto an arm in Fujiwara style, but Muto makes it to the ropes. Muto mounts a bit of a comeback, but is caught with a flying arm bar. I mean, that's, that's kind of the... A bit of a story of the match. Both of them like to target a limb, but Nakamura's after the top limbs and Muto's after the bottom limbs. Muto defends for a while with his hands, but Nakamura eventually breaks the arm free, though it though by then Muto is closer to the ropes and gets a rope break. A shining wizard sends Nakamura through the ropes and gives Muto some recovery time. He drags the challenger partially back over and hits a twisting neck breaker, followed by two more shining wizards. Nakamura blocks the third, 
but runs into a powerbomb, which is followed by another Shining Wizard, but Nakamura kicks out of the pin attempt. Muto sets up the Moonsault and hits it, but again Nakamura kicks out, this time some, with some force. He awaits the next Shining Wizard, ready for the counter, into the heel hook. His Rise teammates are right there in the corner cheering him on, as are most of the fans in attendance, it seems. Nakamura continues to attack the legs and quickly rolls into another ankle lock after Muto reached the ropes. Nakamura drags him right into the middle of the ring, but with a surge of energy, Muto rolls over and breaks free of the hold. Nakamura hits a dragon screw of his own and then goes for the legs again, only to lift Muto into the landslide. He hits it and pins, but Muto kicks out. Nakamura doesn't hesitate in transitioning to an armbar, but once again Muto survives by scraping his way to the ropes. Nakamura goes for the landslide again, but Muto knees him in the head, pulls him over with a hurricanrana, rolling him over with a pin that keeps the challenger down. Muto withholds his emotions as he has retained the championship, staring out at the audience calmly as they excitedly process the unexpected finish. Muto retains the IWGP championship and has defeated Nakamura twice in this current reign. So much for Nakamura being the new guy at the beginning of the year. This was a disappointing match to me, but it might be because I'm a big Nakamura mark. Um, it was a good match. I just don't feel like it reached the level of uh, a big title match. Um... The finish protected Nakamura to a degree, given it was a definitely a surprise pin. But having said that, Muto survives arm bars and heel hooks from kind of you know Nakamura the the shooter kind of, um, as well as well as kicking out of his finish to landslide. So uh, you know, he, I guess it's not like Nakamura's offense was necessarily protected. It was just a finish that made it look like Muto kind of stole it. Um, You know, there's perhaps something to be said for Nakamura starting to work Muto's legs in the middle of the match rather than continuing to um, target the arms and then he kind of went to the legs and then he went back to the arm and, you know, that break in between could have been all it took for Muto to have enough energy and... um, you know, uh, energy left in his arm to be able to uh, survive and, and get to the ropes on that last occasion. But um, given we heard so much from Mike Campbell in this episode, uh, here's what he thought of this one. He says, Maybe it's newfound motivation from getting to wrestle younger guys or just being back in New Japan. Or maybe it's a career resurgence. But either way, I'm liking this Keiji Muto. Three and a quarter stars, he gives it. Now, three and a quarter stars may very well have been what... I think that's probably close to the rating I would have given it myself. Um, Perhaps important to point out that on my scale of terrible, bad, disappointing, fine, good, very good, great, special, disappointing is, is kind of a funny one in that, you know, I could have expected the best match in the world if I got the 10th best best match in the world, um, maybe I'm a little disappointed. Uh, I don't think I would rate that match disappointing, but um, just as an example, you know, disappointing is kind of, it's relative. Anyway, um, that was a big event from New Japan. It took up most of this episode, didn't it? Uh, I'll, I'll give you the 411, basically Mike's uh, impression of the whole event together. Uh, take a very fun and solid undercard and combine it with main events that actually deliver in the ring and you've got one of the best shows of the year. I don't want to say it's better than All Japan only because I don't follow New Japan as closely as I used to and it's All Japan's booking that keeps me interested and it's probably a stretch uh, but it's probably not a stretch to say that at all. Either way, huge recommendation for this bad boy uh, is Mike Campbell's thoughts and I want to thank Mike Campbell for his article. I will link that in the description. Thank you for your help on this podcast in uh, fleshing out a very important event for New Japan. 
Coming up next is the beginning of the G1 Tag League, the fourth and final major tournament for New Japan. That'll be on the next episode. Thank you for listening to this one, and until next time, have a good one.